Welcome, 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 everybody. This is a special day because we have a guest today at Lunch and Learn that I know quite well from another life, and it's a wonderful opportunity to have a reunion. Um, our guest today is Warren Goldstein, who's the Jewish spouse. What a funny introduction, the Jewish spouse. You could say um, husband. Husband also <laughs> works. Husband. <laughs> of the Reverend Donna Schapper, who is the pastor of the Orient Congregational Church. Um, Warren is a professor of history emeritus at the University of Hartford, the author or co-author of six books and a widely published essayist. Um, I'm not gonna talk about what he's going to talk about. I have a little summary, but decided we'll leave it up to him because he will do a much better job. And with that, I turn it over to you, Warren. Well, thank you so much, Judy. And it's great to see you again after all these years. And in fact, you haven't aged a bit. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the only one. Uh, I used to have a head of hair, and now I don't. So um, I also wanted to welcome all the folks who came from Orient Congregational Church. Um, and I have mentioned just about everyone so far, except I did not mention Priscilla Bull. Um, who um, is a good friend and uh, runs the worship committee at Orient Congregational Church and um, longtime Orient resident going back many generations. So welcome to all of you. It's great since I'm going to talk about interfaith issues um, that, um, that I've got an interfaith group here. Um, but because I'm going to be talking about Judaism and or at least my experience with Judaism, I'm going to say some things that are... Um, um, that um, are a little critical um, because um, I'm going to be talking about my experiences and those of my family um, over the last um, 40 years. And uh, some of those will end up being critical of, um, of what we experienced in the Jewish community. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, I, um, I know that Philip Roth got in tons of trouble and wrote novels and short stories about all the trouble he got in with his Jewish neighbors and family members in Newark because he appeared to be washing dirty Jewish linen in front of, as his, as his neighbors put it, the Goyim. Um, I'm not terribly worried about that, but I just wanted you all to know that um, because I've lived in this interfaith setting for a really long time, um, I'm going to excavate some of my own experience. I am gonna do a PowerPoint. Um, I'm gonna do my best not to read um, what's on the PowerPoint because it's one of my pet peeves. Um, and I really, I, I, wanna, I wanna begin by really thanking Rabbi Gotti. Um, I've been telling some version of the story that um, I told him um, at, at, at a lunch, um, actually a, a Christmas and Hanukkah lunch um, held by the Greenfield um, Ecumenical Ministries. And I've told that story, I don't know, dozens of times in one version or another. And the only time that anyone has ever offered um, to give me a platform to talk about in more detail, um, to explain what it might really mean was Rabbi Gotti. Um, so I am deeply grateful to you, Rabbi, for picking up on that and for putting me in front of um, a, a Jewish congregation, which is something that has only happened, you know, two or three times in my whole life. And, um, and the, th the, the first one was actually my bar mitzvah. And then um, I got lucky enough to talk to a synagogue in Adelaide, Australia, when we were there for, um, well, Donna was a scholar in residence at a church there. Um, and this is it. So um, I've spent a lot of time in front of classes over the years. I just want to say one final thing, and that is I love talking to older folks. You know, I was a college professor for, um, for over 30 years. In the last five, 10 years or so, what I noticed the most is that people 18 to 22 year olds were harder and harder to motivate. Um, and it just got to be more of a slog. I used to be able to motivate them when I was really young. When I got older, it just didn't happen anymore. And what I, what I was able to enjoy is talking to older folks um, because they're here because they want to be and not because they're trying to get credits for it or their parents are making them or they've already paid the tuition. So thank you for showing up and just know that it's a real pleasure for me. Um, to be doing this. And let me also welcome Ruth Tuthill, um, who just joined us, also a member of the Orient Congregational Church. 
So um, I'm now going to uh, try to share my screen. We're gonna hope the technology works. We did a quick run through and if it doesn't, let me know. Um, and the sharing screen allows me to do um, a PowerPoint, which will, um, which will help to structure what I'm gonna talk about. So can you all see yes. this slide? That's great. Um, and uh, here we go. So the story that began this presentation um, that I was talking to Rabbi Gadi about um, is, the, uh, is the story of um, the first member of my family um, to be in North America. Um, and I don't know whether you, my screen is showing you are screen sharing. And so I don't know if it gets in the way of uh, my, uh, my great grandfather's name, does it? No. Good. Thank you. So you see that his name is Isaac Luria. Um, by most accounts, he was born in 1868. Um, we have some reason to believe that he was born in what is now called Lithuania. Um, but on census records, um, when he was uh, in, the, in the US, and the earliest census record we have for him is in 1900, because the 1890 census burned, uh, which is a great loss for genealogists and historians. Um, uh, he was uh, listed as having been from Poland or Russia, or Russia or Poland. Um, and if you follow the history um, of that time, Russia and Poland and Lithuania went back and forth. Um, in terms of what they were called. Um, so he arrived, and it's interesting, my brother has recently been trying to figure out exactly where and when he arrived. And there's different, um, and there are different stories in family lore. Um, but the earliest he could have arrived, we think, was late 1885 now or 1886. The latest he could have arrived is 1888. Now, Isaac Luria is such a name, right? Um, it's really one of the great names in Jewish history. We didn't know that growing up because my family was not terribly educated um, in Jewish history or rabbinical history. Um, we, uh, there's not much evidence that we come from Sephardic Jewish stock. Um, there may be more if we go more deeply into Isaac Luria's background. I don't know that we can. Um, to the best of our knowledge, he was Ashkenazi. Um, and for those of you that don't know the difference, Sephardic implies that he came, uh, that, that he might have come originally from Spain or from North Africa um, or the Middle East, in fact, whereas Ashkenazi is Eastern Europe, Eastern European. He was very Eastern European. We sort of wanted to be part of uh, when I learned about who the real Isaac Luria, Luria was or the one, the 16th century Isaac Luria. I've been to his synagogue in Svad, but I don't think we're related. Um, we are not part of Jewish royalty. We are, I think, Jewish peasants. Um, but Isaac Luria was on a boat. And here's the family story. He was in New York Harbor and he had a buddy or someone that claimed to be a buddy. And he said, as they were in the harbor, you can't go to America with a name like Luria. You need a good American name, something that's not so Jewish. And my great grandfather, who, as far as we can tell, was about 18 years old at the time said, okay, like what? And his friend says, I don't know, Goldstein. And so my great-grandfather Isaac Luria became Isaac Goldstein on the boat in New York Harbor. Um, whatever possessed him to, make, to, to take up a German Jewish name, I won't really know, but it, there's some evidence now in the work my brother has been doing that he might have been on a freighter that came from Hamburg because there was a regular line that went from Hamburg to New York. And apparently a lot of Lithuanian Jews, there were even brokers in, in, in Vilna um, that would arrange passage for Jews wanting to leave Lithuania for the United States and would send them to Hamburg where there were, where there were regular service. Having spent a little time in Germany, maybe that's why he found himself attracted to Goldstein. I have no earthly idea, but we are not German Jews. There's nothing in us that's German Jews. There's no one in the whole family uh, who's a German Jew, even though we, not, we all, well, many of us carry um, this Jewish name. So he married Katie Mosilewski, also, as far as I understand it, from Lithuania. And I've got a picture of them here. 
Isaac and Katie. They lived in Baltimore. They also lived in Washington, DC. Um, I knew my great grandfather very, very slightly um, uh, because he died when I was five years old. Um, I have very warm memories of him. I never knew his wife who died um, before the end of World War II. So Katie and Isaac Goldstein, I'm going to um, try to reduce this. I wanna make sure that you can see this. Katie and Isaac Goldstein, and they pronounce it Goldstein for reasons I don't fully understand, but it does suggest um, the German connection here because the more Americanized version would obviously have been Goldstein. They had four children, um, Hattie, Chauncey, Irene, and Goldie. Um, Chauncey, my grandfather, um, married Eleanor, um, who died um, fairly early in the marriage. She had two children, including my father, David, and my aunt, Faye, and then Chauncey remarried Ethel and had Mort, or Morton. But for this story, um, Chauncey and Eleanor had David, um, who then married my mother, Inez. Uh, Inez Pittler, actually, from Pittsburgh. Now, David and Inez Goldstein, my parents had three children. Um, I'm the oldest. Um, next was my brother, Ralph, who married Mindy Buckner, who was Jewish. And they adopted two children um, from, as it happens, the former, I mean, Russia. It was no longer the Soviet Union, Katrina and Dylan. My sister, Ellen, who was the youngest of us, five years younger than I am. And for what it's worth, I was born in 1951. So I am uh, 70, I'm gonna be 71 this year. Uh, Ellen uh, married uh, Bob Flores, who was Catholic. Um, they had two weddings, um, one, um, um, one Catholic and then one in the synagogue. And they have two children, Larissa and Michelle, who I'll get to in a little bit. And then I, married the Reverend Donna Scopper, who is Protestant, actually a member of, longtime member of the United Church of Christ. And we had three children, uh, ha still have all three of those children. Isaac was the first and two years later um, were born the twins, Katie and Jacob. Um, if you heard me right, um, Isaac was almost two when we had Katie and Jacob. So we had three under three for a while, um, which is a period that fortunately I don't remember very well, God is kind. <laughs> um, so the origin story number two um, has to do with how Donna and I got together um, because you really have to wonder how on earth um, does a Jewish boy end up marrying a Christian minister? Um, and it came as a bit of a surprise to me as well. I didn't even know there was such a thing um, as, um, as a Christian minister. I'm sorry, as a female Christian minister um, when I met Donna. So when people ask me how we met, um, I usually begin this way. Um, when, the, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979, which generally gets a bit of a laugh because most people's origin stories don't happen that way. But the truth is we were both at Yale University. Um, I'd gone there as an undergraduate and after a couple of years came back to graduate school in American studies um, where I was studying American history. I didn't know quite what yet at that point. Um, and then Donna um, had already had um, a, basically a 10 year career as a United Church of Christ minister. And she had been brought by her, uh, by her college chaplain who had become chaplain of Yale University to be assistant chaplain at Yale. So when we met, she was actually, I guess, associate chaplain, not assistant. She'd gotten a promotion. And we met because when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan back then, um, President Jimmy Carter, um, then in the last year of his presidency, um, began draft registration. And for those of us that had lived through the Vietnam War and had spent some time um, opposing that war, um, the reimposition of draft registration 
um, was something we thought was a serious mistake and needlessly militarizing um, American foreign policy. And so there were plans to, what else did one do when something happened um, regarding a war or the draft? We decided to plan a teach-in. And the group that was planning that teach-in met in Donna's office. She had a very large office at Yale and lots of groups that wanted to organize um, political meetings had them in her office. Um, I had no idea there was, I, I, I had not darkened the door of the chaplain's office at Yale. Um, and I had no idea that there even was an assist, uh, associate chaplain. I certainly didn't know that there was a, a, a female minister who was an associate chaplain. And I really had no idea that there was gonna be this terrifically good looking, very snazzily dressed um, female minister um, serving as chaplain. So I thought she looked terrific. Um, oh, that's too soon for that. Um, and we were both with other people at the time, um, but the group that planned that teach-in worked together for a while and we stayed together for a while afterwards to think about what other sorts of political things we could do. And Donna and I became better friends. And at a certain point, a group I was involved with was having a dance. Um, I, as a fundraiser, I went to sell her a ticket to the dance. She bought two, which really bothered me because I only wanted her to buy one. Um, and uh, I was taking tickets at that dance. Um, when at about 11 o'clock, when I was at, you know, one, with a friend um, taking tickets, uh, this was all basically graduate students and junior faculty. And she came in wearing a absolutely killer black cocktail dress and heels, plunked her two tickets down on the table, looked behind her as though someone was going to be coming with her, but no one came in the door with her. And at that point, I asked my colleague to continue taking tickets and Donna and I danced um, for the next two or three hours. It was absolutely wonderful, not least because- uh, I was talking to you. Excuse me? <laughs> Someone has unmuted himself, that's fine. Uh, Anyway, we had a ball. I had a ball, not least because my ex-girlfriend was there. Everyone at this entire party was wearing jeans and t-shirts, except Donna, who was wearing this amazing cocktail dress and high heels and looked absolutely smashing. We began going out and, and then we went on a, on vacation together. And we went to Cooperstown, New York, where I was doing research for my PhD dissertation, which then became my first book. And why Cooperstown? Because I was writing about the early history of baseball and the best place, the only real library that had any serious collections having to do with baseball were at the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. And so we went to Cooperstown and uh, uh, ended up spending a couple of weeks there. Um, and at the end of that vacation, and just to get a sense of what we looked back, looked like way back then, um, you can certainly understand why I fell in love with Donna um, at this point. It may be harder to understand why she fell for me um, since there's so little of myself you could actually see given all the hair. Um, and uh, at the end of that vacation, we had fallen in love. The following summer, we went back to Cooperstown. Uh, I did more research and we got engaged. Um, so on the shores of Lake Otsego in 1981, we got engaged and we wanted to get married the following year. But we immediately faced, we faced into all kinds of problems. First of all, I thought my family would be delighted that because they worried about my um, romantic life, they had never really liked anybody I'd gone out with. They really liked Donna. Um, my brother and sister really liked Donna. And so I thought everybody was going to be super excited when I called them to tell them that we had gotten engaged. 
And instead, my mother took to her bed for three days. Um, all sorts of family members that I'd been really close to were suddenly talking about um, the family's genetic inheritance and how could I do this? And um, it caused an enormous bunch of blow ups in the family, which I confess I was a little surprised by. I know I shouldn't have been. Now I know that because, because I'm 70 years old, but I was really pretty surprised. And I suppose at this point I should, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing screen for just a second so I can see you all. Um, I, uh, what kind of a Jew was I at that point? It's probably relevant. Well, I'd been bar mitzvahed, but except for the actual bar mitzvah, the whole experience of Hebrew school had been extraordinarily painful. Um, I'd had, um, like many uh, Jews who remember Hebrew school, a horrible experience. Um, it was made more horrible by the fact that I was doing a bar mitzvah a year late because we'd lived in the Philippines. Um, when I turned 13, my father was a career naval officer. Um, so we were in the Philippines. There was no, uh, not much bar mitzvah training to be had there. So I ended up in Hebrew school in one of the, in a desk that was sort of two grades um, below mine um, with kids who were nine and 10 when I was 13 years old. Um, and Mr. Rabinowitz, who was the principal, did not have a lot of sympathy for me. I was terrible at Hebrew. And so I felt a, uh, Let's just say I, I did not enjoy Hebrew school. I enjoyed very little of my bar mitzvah uh, training. Um, thank goodness for the bar mitzvah. It worked okay. But after that, I really didn't do anything Jewish for a really long time, except attend the bar mitzvahs of my brother and sister. So it didn't really stick for me. Um, and it's not something I'm terribly proud of. It's just what was. So for the next bunch of years, and I mean quite a few years, um, I did not darken the door of a temple or synagogue. I didn't go to high holiday services. I knew I was Jewish, but I didn't really, I didn't have a sense of what that might have meant religiously. Um, and I know I did something that was terribly painful to my mother when I was having an operation um, uh, while I was in college at the military hospital in Honolulu where we lived. Um, my mother had come to visit me and um, she looked at the chart um, at the bottom of the bed and under religion was written none. Well, the only way you could have gotten none is if I told them I had no religion, um, which was silly, but it was the kind of um, silly rebellion that um, a 19 or 20 year old engages in. And that's where I was religiously. So when I fell in love with a Christian minister, I suppose, even though it never occurred to me that this would be the case, and, and, and in fact, never did occur to me, my parents were terrified that I was going to convert to Christianity. Absolutely terrified. And at that point, they, 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 they lived long enough to know that most marriages result in children, and that meant they might just have all these Christian children and no more Jewish children. And so they were, I think, terrified of that. Um, and at a certain level, now being who I am and actually a grandparent, I kind of get it. Let me go back to sharing the screen. Nevertheless, Don and I were determined to get married. And we couldn't find anyone to marry us. And why was that? Well, partly because we wanted to do a dual religious ceremony. Donna, after all, had a religious tradition um, that she had grown up in, was committed to, and did for a living. Um, so she easily picked a minister friend who would be part of the, a team, we hoped, um, to marry us. I started calling around. I called um, Hillel rabbis um, all over the Northeast. Um, and the answers I got were, oh, wow, you want what? Oh, no. Oh, no. No, no, no. I, I couldn't possibly do that. And so the short answer was no one, no rabbi would do it. It's not completely true. There was a fellow who said, you know, 
Um, yeah, for 450 bucks plus gas and tolls. And somehow I thought the gas and tolls put me off. Um, and we didn't know what to do. But in fact, a number of these Hillel rabbis were kind enough to point out that in their words, in Judaism, you didn't need a rabbi to perform the wedding service. So as long as there was, so someone, any Jew could perform the part that a rabbi might perform, as long as there was someone that the state had um, agreed to make, the state uh, that was certified by the state to make a legal marriage. And since the minister in question um, was in fact such a person, um, any Jew could do the service. So I thought I finally had an answer. And I told my parents this one day, and my mother, um, <laughs> my mother, bless her, uh, bless her memory, um, said, Warren, in our religion, a rabbi does the wedding. And I said, Mom, we have the same religion. Rabbis told me this. And she just said, Warren, in our religion, a rabbi does the wedding. This almost, I mean, we were at a kind of stalemate and we nearly ruptured relationships, which I have to say, my folks were willing to repair. So instead of my, the gauntlet that I threw down being met with another gauntlet being thrown down, um, my father actually flew up to the nearest airport to us um, in Hartford, and we had a tearful reconciliation, and we got married. So it's not a very good um, copy of the picture because I didn't want to take it out of the frame, and so there's reflection from the glass. Um, in the behind us is my friend Jerry Kleiner, um, and you see the fringe of the chuppah um, right here at the top and our siblings are on either side. And unfortunately, the minister is actually behind Donna, so you can't really see her. It was an absolutely spectacular wedding in my own view. Um, so we had actually spent the entire previous evening hanging the chuppah, which was a, uh, an antique shawl that we had bought um, from the apple trees in our, neighbor, in our next door neighbor's backyard. And we got married. on July 4th, 1982. And we are approaching our 40th wedding anniversary this July 4th. So this is hard to see. And I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can actually, no, I don't think I can. Um, this, was, uh, this was our wedding service. And we really meant to have a dual wedding service. This is actually something that we have framed um, but you see, we have um, uh, betrothal blessings in Hebrew, um, Psalm 146, uh, something from 1 Corinthians, intentions, and then here we have, um, we each said Hebrew as we put rings on our fingers. Um, we did not have the seven blessings, we shortened them to five, um, and I'm sorry, and then we ended with the threefold blessing. Um, which is down here. And then we broke a glass. My parents were ecstatic at the wedding because as it turns out, as many, um, as many of you know, um, the main thing that uh, makes Jews most uncomfortable at any kind of Christian service is the mention of Jesus. Um, Donna did not feel that she had to um, announce Jesus's name in our wedding. Um, and so uh, there was this enormous sigh of relief um, that could be heard throughout the Northeast um, as Donna and Warren got married and the, um, and Jesus wasn't mentioned. So everybody had a great time at our wedding. Um, and, but of course, the only question they really wanted to know about when we announced our wedding was, what about the children? The real question I've come to think was, what about the parents? Um, because how were we going to live our religious lives 
um, even before we had children, because that's what was going to decide what, um, what we wanted to do about kids. And the answer was, we didn't know. It was really hard for Donna to marry a Jew. She had to pray about it because she really worried whether this was um, something that was going to undermine um, a faith that was extraordinarily important to her and that she preached every Sunday. Um, by the time we were married, she had her own congregation in Amherst, Massachusetts, um, and she was preaching every Sunday. Um, we had to wonder how it would be for her to have a Jewish husband at a Christian congregation. Um, and it turns out, um, for the record, so those of you who wonder this question um, get the answer, is that we Donna has pastored, um, I think, half a dozen congregations um, as a solo pastor in our time together. And no one in any of those congregations has been anything but extraordinarily welcoming to me as a Jew. Extraordinarily welcoming. Um, it's something that um, I never expected among Christian congregations, and it was a kind of a surprise, but it's been really one of the most wonderful things about our life together. Um, I like congregations, and they've been, um, they seem to have um, returned the favor. But I wasn't, I said before that I never occurred to me that I was going to, um, that I was going to convert to Christianity. Um, and the truth is that by being with Donna and learning more and more, because in the very early days of her preaching a sermon every night, she actually showed them to me. Um, before they went to the final version, I learned a lot more about Christianity than I'd ever known about Judaism, and I knew that I wasn't Christian, and I knew that I would never be a Christian. And so, in this interesting and paradoxical way, I became much more of a Jew by marrying a Christian minister. That experience of being married to a Christian minister forced me to uh, define myself as a Jew in ways that I had never had to do previously, because this time I was on my own. It wasn't that I was doing what my parents had planned out for me, which is to say a bar mitzvah. Um, that doesn't mean that we went to temple. We didn't because going to temple or going to synagogue on Friday night and, and or Saturday morning and church on Sunday was a whole lot of religion on the weekends. And one of us was a religious professional and the other one wasn't. Um, but the truth is that I began um, thinking more about the high holidays. I'd occasionally go to high holiday services when I could. Um, and once we did have children, which turned out to be pretty quickly, you know, Isaac, our first, was born um, just about a year, uh, 11 months after we got married. And so we had the question of children forces um, conversation, forces decisions. We did our best, we thought, we, to raise our kids what we called both ways. What did that mean? Well, they went to church as children because. It really wasn't okay for the minister not to produce her kids at church and Sunday school. Um, and that worked pretty well. And occasionally, <laughs> occasionally Donna would really push Hebrew school. Um, and I would say to her, Donna, you have this idea about Hebrew school and Sunday school that it's gonna be this wonderful thing. And I had a horrible experience and every single one of my friends I don't know about you all, but I do know that every single one of my friends who went to Hebrew school hated it pretty much from beginning to end. And I said, I don't know that I can do this to my kids, but we tried. And so I, um, <laughs> so I, we lived in Riverhead um, when the kids were um, getting to the point that they could have started, um, they could have started uh, Hebrew school, Sunday school. Um, and we lived about half a mile from the, uh, from the, the temple in River, the synagogue in Riverhead. Um, and so I called them up one day 
And I said, well, um, do you have a Sunday school and can my kids go or, or a Hebrew school? And can my kids go? And they said, well, are your children Jewish? And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, do they have a Jewish mother? And, it, and I said, well, no, they don't. And they said, that's okay. As long as they convert to Judaism, it will be okay. Now, I'm going to stop sharing because I got to say this looking people in the eye. I have to tell you, I know that these are rules, and I found them so deeply offensive that I was turned off from the kids getting any kind of religious education for the next half dozen years. As far as I was concerned, my kids were Jewish. They were Jewish, and they were Christian, and they were Jewish. And the idea that they would have to go through a formal conversion ceremony to be allowed to go to an experience that I had found dreadful, but was willing to do on behalf of their religious education and on behalf of my wife's impression of their religious education, that stung. And as you can tell, I have feelings about it many years later. Now I'm going to go back to the screen. So, sorry about this. So um, when the kids were nine or 10 or so, we moved. We moved to Amherst, Massachusetts, and Donna no longer had a pastorate. She was actually kind of a bishop in her denomination, which meant that she didn't have a home congregation to which she had to produce or at which she had to produce her kids on Sunday morning. And so since that coincided with um, the time that they should start Bar and Bat Mitzvah training, we joined the Jewish community of Amherst, uh, which was a reconstructionist congregation headed at the time by um, Rabbi Sheila Peltz Weinberg um, with an extraordinary, um, an extraordinary cantor actually a, a convert named Catherine Madsen. And I have to say that was, um, that was sort of the beginning of my uh, conversion back to Judaism, because as part of the Bar and Bat Mitzvah training, I had to take the kids to, uh, which I supervised, of course, because Dada doesn't know a word of Hebrew. Um, and uh, I, that's not true. She knows a few words of Hebrew. Um, but I supervised that training. And as part of the, the, the contract that they made with parents, you had to take the kids to a certain number of services. It was a lot. So I went to a lot of Saturday morning services with my kids, made somewhat easier because they actually had Jewish friends um, in town. And so it wasn't unusual um, for uh, when they went to Hebrew school and Bar and Bat Mitzvah training, um, they, um, they, they were with um, other kids who they went to school with, which helped. However, and this is the thing I also want to say to Jews who are welcoming of um, interfaith couples, the welcome to the interfaith couple at the Jewish community of Amherst, which in many ways is a very fine institution, was really hoping that the spouse, the non-Jewish spouse, would convert to Judaism. Since this simply wasn't on in our case, we made everybody um, we made everybody extraordinarily uncomfortable. And so for years, what it felt like was that the welcome from organized Judaism, even when we were trying to come into it, was uh, we were constantly facing barriers. And so what we experience is, is no, 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 no. You know, we, we don't really want you. When we met with the rabbi, um, about the bar mitzvah services of our kids, the rabbi was made extraordinarily uncomfortable by Donna even being there. Um, she was uh, told, by the way, that she was not welcome on the pulpit um, during the bar and bat mitzvah services for our children. It felt terrible. It felt terrible to be trying to get into, to return to an institution, I mean, return to the religion of my ancestors and to have it be made so difficult. So when I referred earlier, um, when I referred earlier to saying things that were somewhat critical and difficult, um, 
I need to, I need, this is really important to me. We wanted to be, we wanted to do something important to the Jewish identity of our family and our children. And no one else seemed to want that to happen. We were grudgingly accepted into the Jewish community. That hurt, I have to tell you. And I worry as organized religion loses adherence um, you know, across the board, um, I got to wonder about why so many institutions in organized religion put, put such barriers in the way of people joining those very institutions. Rabbi Gadi. So my answer, when people come to me and say, Rabbi, you know, I'm spiritual, I, you know, I'm Jewish, but you know, I'm, I don't believe in uh, organized religion. So I say, don't worry, we're not that organized. So, you know, I think because we're not organized enough, we make those mistakes. It could be. We haven't really thought through what it means. What we do is we know what the rules were and we know what the rules are. And people have a whole lot easier time enforcing rules than they have. And by the way, this is cross-religious, trans-religious, trans-institutional religion. It's a whole lot easier to enforce the rules than it is to be, have what um, in the United Church of Christ, when they're really good at it, they call extravagant welcome. And I felt this painfully in the Jewish community. I'm gonna go back to sharing screen because I wanna actually get through this. So, I want to actually talk about the, the other children in my family and then about my own children and Jewishness and how it played out. And this is a long conversation and I'm going to try to condense it. So my brother, Ralph, I mentioned before, married a Jewish woman, Mindy Buckner, and had two kids. They never went to a day of Hebrew school. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention my children were all bar and bat mitzvah. I think you were good. That was implied, but I just want to make sure you know it. Um, Katrina Goldstein, and uh, by the way, they pronounce it Goldstein. I pronounce it Goldstein. I never understood why, but um, they have um, never been to uh, a synagogue, a temple, um, except for the funeral service of their grandfather, um, to the best of my knowledge, even though my brother and his Jewish wife were married in a synagogue. My sister, Ellen, married uh, her Catholic husband, Bob, and she has two children, Larissa and Michelle, uh, both of whom, I might add, taught Sunday school um, for a while in the temple that they belong to. Um, Larissa, while Michelle uh, still attends a uh, reform synagogue from time to time, um, she was not married in a synagogue. Larissa, um, <laughs> Larissa, um, made Aliyah um, and, um, <laughs> and got terribly involved in Chabad um, in Jerusalem um, and uh, met another woman um, who was also in Chabad in Jerusalem and they fell in love and they got married. They got married at my sister's house um, by a woman Actually, I believe a trans uh, rabbi um, who was sort of the spiritual leader of their Chabad in Jerusalem. If you find this surprising, so did we. And so I now want to talk about my own children because I'm absurdly proud of them. And so I don't know if you can see this, but if you can, you see the marriage that launched the tears. So three children. Isaac, the first, is now director of voice, creativity, and culture, the Nathan Cummings Foundation, which, by the way, is a Jewish family foundation doing a lot of social justice work. Um, his first big job out of college was as director of one of the first half dozen, actually, he was one of the first three or four staff people at J Street, um, founded by Jeremy Ben-Avi, 
And when he left J Street, he went to the Interfaith Seminary, Auburn Seminary, where for six or seven years, he was vice president for media and action. Um, and Isaac, who identifies very much as Jewish, and we'll get to his family in a minute. Katie um, is direct, who also identifies as Jewish, is director of housing campaigns at the Center for Popular Democracy and former ED of Tenants and Neighbors of New York, a tenants rights organization. Um, Jacob, um, her twin brother um, is, um, uh, you can see what he does for a living. He's the sort of agnostic in the bunch. So when Isaac Goldstein was getting married, he was getting married to a young woman named Sarah Flanzer. So the question came up for them of what their names were going to be. When Donna and I got married, it was not so much an issue. Why? Because she was not going to become the Reverend Donna Goldstein. And you can mull on, you can enjoy that for a little while. I can't see your eyes, but just imagining the idea of the Reverend Donna Goldstein ought to be worth at least a chuckle. Um, in any event, I mean, she's a feminist. I'm a feminist. We wanted her to have her own name. She already had a professional career. That was a done deal. Isaac and Sarah wanted to have the same name because they wanted to have the same name when they went to pick the kids up at school. It turned out Donna and I wanted that too, but it didn't matter. They all called her Mrs. Goldstein. It didn't matter what her name was when we picked up kids at school. So all through school, she was Mrs. Goldstein. It didn't matter who she was in town. Anyway, so were they to be Isaac and Sarah Goldstein? No, because Sarah was a feminist. She wanted her own name. Were they gonna keep their names separately? No, they weren't because they wanted the same name. Were they gonna hyphenate? That's a terrible name to hyphenate. So what did they do? Well, Isaac came to me one day and he said, you know, what about going back to Pop Pop's name? That is to say, my great grandfather's name. And I said, well, talk to my father about it. And he talked to my father who said, my grandfather was my best friend. That sealed it. And they became Isaac and Sarah Luria. Oh, yes. Sarah was going to begin rabbinical school at HUC, Jewish Institute of Religion in New York City. Um, as soon as she got married, she'd already been accepted. And um, so now we have Isaac Luria, kind of a name to conjure with in the Jewish community. And it didn't hurt Sarah Luria in rabbinical school to have the same last name, I don't think. They have had a Jewish household ever since they got married in an extraordinary wedding under the arch in Washington Square Park in New York City. And then of course the reception was at Judd's Memorial Church where Donna was senior minister, but it happened to be right on the park. And so we didn't have far to go for the reception. Their three children, Caleb Benjamin attends, by the way, he's just begun bar mitzvah training and his bar mitzvah date has been set for October. He is a student at Lynn, <laughs> Lander Greenspoon Academy, a Jewish school in Northampton, Massachusetts. Eva Juliet Luria just turned 10. And Judah Abraham Luria is also a student of at Lander Greenspoon Academy. So Jacob Goldstein, my young, our younger son, got married next. And he had fallen in love with a young woman with his sister's first name, Katie Denslow a pretty much lapsed Protestant um, wasp from a Minnesota suburb. And they were trying to figure out the name game also. Should they keep their names? Well, no, because hers was the name of her father who her mother had divorced. And she really had been telling Katie she was gonna change her name when she got married. She would be the second Katie Goldstein in the family and maybe the first Katie Goldstein wasn't wild about that. Were they going to hyphenate the names? No. And so they made a decision and I think you can probably see where this is coming. They became Jacob and Katie Luria. So now the second one of my kids to get married went back to the name of my great grandfather. They adopted. Wow. Um, an African-American girl um, and who goes by Sky, who is Skylar Emma, and she's now five years old. Katie Goldstein, 
thought her brothers were wusses for changing the family name. So when she fell in love with and got married to Becky Aleman, who is Mexican-American from uh, Austin, Texas, um, what were they going to do with their names? What were they going to do? Katie didn't want to do this. She didn't want to change her name to Becky. Becky didn't want to change her name to Katie. Whoops. So what happened? They hyphenated. And they had a daughter. Who I sometimes call the light of my life. Her name is Anza Natividad for Becky's grandmother. Um, and they are hyphenated. So they are Katie and Becky Aleman Goldstein and their grand and their daughter, my youngest granddaughter is Anza Natividad Aleman Goldstein. So the children, I'm sorry, the great, great and great, great, great grandchildren of Isaac and Katie, Isaac Luria, now then Goldstein, Goldstein are, the, are these different religions. They are Jewish, but they incorporate Orthodox, Reform, Reconstructionist, and Renewal types. There are atheists and agnostics, and I'm not sure who's which. There's one Protestant. There's a Catholic. Becky, we are in the family Black, White, Brown straight and queer. Just so you have some pictures to put to that list, this is Isaac and Sarah and baby Caleb in his first year. He's now gonna be bar mitzvah this year. Here are those three children at an Easter egg hunt that we would have every Easter morning at Washington Square Park in New York City. They like making faces when you try to take their picture. Caleb on the right, Eva on the left, Judah in the foreground. At my niece Larissa's wedding, left to right, Katie Goldstein, Isaac Luria, Jacob Luria, and Becky Aleman Goldstein. When we were together last summer, Becky on the left, then Katie, then the other Katie, Luria, then Jacob, Luria, Skyler, and Anza. And so I've talked about how um, it was hard in our religious lives together to feel um, welcomed by Jewish institutions. Interestingly, the ones that welcomed us the most were the outsiders. Folks like Rabbi Arthur Waskow, who Donna became very good friends with when she had a pastorate in Philadelphia decades and decades ago, and who came to her church um, to do a Seder, a full Seder on a Monday Thursday when Christians celebrate um, a, kind of, a kind of Seder and Passover. The place where I'm still a member now, Congregation Beit Simchat Torah, the largest LGBTQ um, Jewish congregation in the world in New York City, headed by Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum. The institution Lab Shul, led by Rabbi Abichai Laulavi, which I think is pioneering new and different ways of Jewish worship. Um, they're really quite spectacular. Um, and organizations like the super important Jews for racial and economic justice, known as JFREG, um, based in New York City. Um, my daughter, uh, Katie, was actually on the board of that organization for a while. And of course, you folks, because of Rabbi Gadi. So I'd like to step back from the stories um, I've been talking about um, for the last hour um, and give a little bit more of an analytical uh, take a more of an analytical look um, at those stories. Not exactly like a sociologist, because I'm not a sociologist, but I think that there may be what we can call some lessons out of this story, or at least lessons that I've tried to uh, extract um, from these stories. So here's a list, and I'm going to, uh, and I'll talk about them for the next few minutes. 
first of all, I want to draw your attention to something that I've certainly mentioned before, but here it is stated quite baldly. Which of the three marriages of my parents' children, mine, my brothers, and my sisters, actually produced Jews? Um, so uh, my brother and his wife were the only fully Jewish, no, they're not fully, only Jewish couple um, of the three of us. And they produced, two, they have two children, but no Jewish children. There's been no Jewish observance in their house, um, no, uh, no Jewish ceremonies, um, no bar or bat mitzvah, no Hebrew school, no Sunday school. And, um, and my brother and his wife only attended um, synagogue um, extraordinarily rarely and my hunch is under pressure. Um, my sister who married the Catholic, you may remember, um, produced two Jewish daughters um, one of whom made Aliyah in Israel um, and joined a Chabad. Um, and whenever she visits home uh, from Israel, her parents uh, kosherize the house um, for her time there and observe Shabbat um, pretty strictly. Um, and her other daughter uh, taught Sunday school in the temple in which she was bat mitzvahed. Um, and, then, um, and then there's my marriage to Donna, um, the one that produced the most uh, uh, storm and drung um, in my family. Um, and that one um, actually produced two Jews, two self-identified Jews, um, one of whom um, uh, married a, a woman who became a rabbi. Um, another, my daughter, uh, a board member of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, um, they both uh, engage in regular um, Shabbat candle lightings, Shabbat dinners. And in fact, my son Isaac and his wife, Rabbi Sarah Luria, um, for a while uh, ran, uh, invented and ran a home-based uh, synagogue in Brooklyn known as Beloved and are now part of a, helping to coordinate a national network of such home-based Jewish experiments. Um, only one of our children, Jacob, um, has not engaged in any kind, much uh, religious uh, observance, um, really, uh, since his own wedding. So, my parents worry. Now, just a few minutes ago, I said, or maybe more like 45 minutes ago, I said that um, I could sort of understand why my parents um, were so worried um, about me marrying a professional Christian. I had not been showing much Jewish uh, self-consciousness um, for really a, a very long time, um, better part of 15 years, I'd say. Um, and so I marry a professional Christian. And I think, and I, and I said to you all that they were probably right to worry um, that uh, Judaism might die out in the family. What were they concerned about? They were concerned probably that I would convert to Christianity and at that point then raise Christian children. Now, I think that there's another way of looking at this as well. Um, suppose, and we've talked about um, why this wasn't going to happen, but let's suppose that I was completely entranced with Christianity, fell in love with this 2000 year old religion, which was represented and has been represented exquisitely by Donna for the last 40 years, um, and suppose I did convert. Had that happened, it would have meant that I had a far stronger connection to the divine than I had manifested for the previous 15 years. It wouldn't have been the kind of divine that my parents wanted, but the kind of divine my parents wanted was one that I found completely, I don't know what the what right word is, but certainly not compelling. Um, certainly not welcoming, and not something that made me feel good about religion, to the point that when, as I mentioned, when I was in a hospital bed, um, and they wanted to know what my religion was, I uh, gladly put down none, um, because I was, at that point, not the slightest bit interested in religion. Had I, however, converted, I would wonder why, at a certain level, why my parents would not have been happy that I had found a relationship with God, which is something that I wasn't really demonstrating for the previous 15 years, really since my bar, since my bar mitzvah. 
So this leads me to sort of raise the question, what about Donna? What about Donna in this story? Consider her and her own children. So she had the same three children that I did, and none of them self-identify as Christians. None of them engage in independent Christian religious practice. They will attend church with us and with her on big holidays, but does it ever strike them to go to church of a Sunday? Absolutely not. And so then ask, how is that mother of those children, a religious professional, to think about the fact that she doesn't have any Christian children at all? So she has two Jewish children and one sort of not really figuring out where he is. What is she supposed to think about that? Well, here's the answer, because I know the answer, because I've been married to her for almost 40 years. And that is that she thinks that a relationship with God or whatever name God goes by, whether it be Allah, Spirit, Ruach, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, breath or life force is what matters, that a relationship with the divine, with spirit, with something larger than human beings is what has always mattered to her more than the particular container in which people experience and express their beliefs. So in fact, her most recent book, which is actually not published yet, this is a, I'm an author, so of course I'm going to do a little plug for Donna's book, but it's right on target here. It's called Marriage Beyond Religion. And it began, its working title for several years was Marrying Outside Your Tribe. And she did uh, workshops on that at NYU when she was a chaplain at NYU in the city, um, when she was at Judson Memorial Church. And this grew into an idea for a book because of all the people that were coming to her looking for counseling about marrying people outside their birth religion. Anyway, that book should be out um, within the next six months or so, published by Roman and Littlefield. And you can find out a whole lot more about what she thinks about these issues in her book, rather than relying on me to, um, rather than relying on me to, uh, to translate her. And the last thing I wanna say along these lines is that this story makes me wonder and at least pose the question to you all. Has most institutional Judaism, is it possibly holding on too tightly to older definitions of what makes a Jewish family? Certainly that's the experience that we had in most of the Jewish institutions we tried to be a part of while our kids were growing up. That holding on too tightly to rules, to barriers, to the right way of doing things turned out really not to work for us and I wonder, given the numbers, um, sociologically, um, whether it's really not working for American Jews who are worried, and I think quite rightly, by the fact that synagogues are closing um, in the reform and conservative movements almost as frequently as they are in most of American Protestantism um, and Catholicism, for that matter. So what might a lesson be from the story that I've um, uh, talked about today? It is that if you hold on just a little more loosely and are a little more welcoming to folks who are outside of the, what do I want to call it? The fold outside of the rules, outside of the way it has always been done. Well, then it might just be possible that you get more Jews that way because the Jews you do get are those that are living a life that's more complicated. The modern world is more complicated. We know many more intermarriages. And since what we know is that Jewish boys and girls, young men and women are going to be involved with non-Jews, the question really for Jews who don't wanna see the religion die out is how do you keep attracting those folks into Jewish religious practice, whatever form it takes. And I'm suggesting that you do that by holding on a little less tightly 
to the way it's always been and figuring out ways to be more welcoming to those who are experiencing interfaith life. Um, so there are not many places that have welcomed us. And so I just want to say uh, again, how grateful I am to have been given this, um, this opportunity by Rabbi Gotti, who, um, who picked up on what he thought was a good story. And I just hope that I haven't disappointed him and you all over the last hour or so. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, really, Warren. And I, before, welcome. Before I, before I let Sarah and Judy uh, kind of conclude the session, I would, I would say, yes, I'm in the business of stories. So I picked up on this story. I think you're, you know, you're a definition of, uh, I guess, an American family, the uh, kind of the, the big lab called America that kind of brings everybody together. So, and none of us could have predicted this at all when we got married. I mean, one of the things that I've known about our marriage is that we, we knew that we couldn't predict what was going to come next. And our kids ended up surprising us in all kinds of ways that we had no idea about. We have time for, thank you. It we was have a time for just a couple of questions, Carol. Yeah, I don't, it's uh, for your beautiful family and uh, welcome. And um, uh, I guess we all, many of us could tell us, you know, a related story. And, and But I was just curious, how did Donna come about uh, you know, why were the children raised both? Why how, to have them bar mitzvah, is a, which is a statement? Um, does she have an equivalent, or if there is such a thing in, uh, you know, a Protestant service? There are equivalents, and there, it's, it's yeah. confirmation. Um, yeah. And, and, our and kids, he, well, how did she get to go with the bar mitzvah, which is a confirmation of being Jewish? Yeah. So she also did, I mean, her, the, the kids all went through varieties of confirmation services okay. as well. Um, well did. We did belong to a church um, when they were also um, being uh, going through bar mitzvah stuff um, at, uh, the, in Amherst. Um, so they had, there were, um, they, they, they were part of confirmation services as well. So they we did. decided I just, I just, yeah. that they were going to do both so that they could, so that they could choose. Okay. And they've all pretty much chosen. You know, Katie has chosen Jewish, Isaac has chosen very Jewish, and Jacob has chosen pretty much agnostic. Um, and, uh, but we wanted to make sure that they had some background so that when they rejected it, they would know what they were rejecting. So they did, they did services in both. That's what I was interesting. Okay. They did. Yes. And what do you think made the difference for them? What do you think made the two children become definitely much more Jewish in their total orientation. Um, the communities that they fell in with. So Isaac um, surprised the hell out of us because um, when he walked into Trinity College, a formerly Episcopalian school in, um, in Hartford, Connecticut, which is the, um, one of the very few places he got into college, he, um, he went to Hillel. And this is a kid who had done nothing Jewish on his own. I mean, I was, it used to kill me that I would, I would have to drag them to one day of high holiday services um, and they would all abandon me. Um, and so I went to the services on my own for the longest time. And then Isaac emails us that he went into Hillel and he met this girl. <laughs> And the girl met him. That does it. <laughs> and she, and that's, that's the way it works. Yeah. That sort of did it for him. And she was on, she want, had wanted to be a rabbi since she was a kid. I mean, in a way, also, Isaac married a version of his mother. Um, you know, I mean, he wore for a while, he wore a t shirt that said, My mom's a minister, my wife's a rabbi, get over it. Uh, <laughs> for, Katie, for Katie, when she got to New York, um, she met a bunch of Jewish activists. And so she was part of the Avodah program when she was right. at Sarah Lawrence. She went to Sarah Lawrence, not a terribly Jewish place, um, but, she, but it was New York. And she went to the Avodah Jewish service program and she ended up being placed at Tenants and Neighbors. Um, she met Jewish activists and eventually more Jewish queer activists. 
And that was the community that she found. She's also, by the way, completely comfortable going to church with us, you know, um, and she feels at home um, in a church. And she also uh, always came with me to CBST's high holiday services um, because she wanted to be in a queer identified space. Unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. the reaction you had to reading a, a Christian text over a long period of time, was there one particular factor there in your reading that um, had caused the reaction that you had, or was it just accumulation of, of uh, the, 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 the readings that, that told you you would, you would not convert, you would not? So um, I knew I was culturally Jewish. You know, um, I knew that, you know, I, what can I say? I was kind of a Woody Allen Jew um, when I was in college and graduate school. Um, I, even though I didn't grow up around other Jews, I sort of felt like New York Jewish culture spoke to me in a way that Christian culture did not. Um, but it's interesting because I ended up writing a biography of a Christian minister, and I still know more Christian theology than I know Jewish theology because I really had to study that theology to be able to write his biography. And if I would say, there are things I really like about Christian theology. I was just saying this to someone in, in, uh, a couple of days ago. I love the theology of Christmas, for instance. The idea of God coming to earth as a vulnerable child who needs protection from a community, I think is gorgeous. Um, on the other hand, the whole Easter thing, you know, the cross, that's a much harder, that's a much harder thing for Jews to wrap their head around. Uh, Jews are not into that kind of self-sacrifice, the sort of emphasis on blood and blood of the lamb it just doesn't, it just never spoke to me. I understand it kind of uh, uh, intellectually, but it never really worked for me. So that's not terribly intellectually, um, you know, respectable, but it is sort of my own reaction to the theology that I've read and the services that speak to me. Does that make any sense? Liz? I have a, a question. Uh, when it struck me when when you said uh, that you you became more Jewish in a sense in this relationship. You know, it's very interesting. And I and at a certain point, you said, "Well, I knew I wasn't Christian." You know, in this relationship. So, what what made you know that you were not Christian? Well, um, some of what I just said. You know. Um, Easter, you know, Easter is sort of central to Christianity, and it really didn't work for me, you know, and, uh, and also I was sort of comfortable thinking of myself as Jewish, even when I didn't know, I mean, even though I don't know much Jewish theology, um, the little bit that I had read, I mean, Heschel spoke to me more. Although I have to say, you know, I read a lot of Niebuhr um, to do that biography and, um, and Niebuhr speak, I mean, Niebuhr actually explicitly identified a certain kind of Christianity as more Hebraic. Um, and so I was sort of, I was kind of drawn to Niebuhr. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know what more I can say, Gotti. Um, I, had a, I had a very strong feeling that um, the whole sort of Easter thing really wasn't mine. Um, and that I couldn't sort of, emo I, I just had, I felt no emotional connection to it. Whereas oddly, I like the sort of, um, I like the feelings around Christmas. Um, and though I wasn't raised that way, we never had a quote Hanukkah bush. We never had a Christmas tree. Um, I rather enjoy Christmas carols. Um, now I choose to sing them. I was forced to sing them in elementary school uh, and middle school and resented the heck out of it. Um, now I rather enjoy them. Warren, thank you for a terrific, enlightening, fascinating presentation.